We are joined there from Inverness, Scotland, by Dr. Nick Needham. Dr. Needham, uh, I guess it's good afternoon for you, yes? It's five o'clock in the afternoon. Five o'clock in the afternoon, and you are at uh, the college. Uh, tell us a little bit about the college. Uh, uh, how long have you been there? Where is it located? Uh, let people know sort of where you're coming from. Right, this is the Highland Theological College, which is a, a confessional college based on the Westminster Confession of Faith, but with liberty of conscience for Baptists <laughs> on all those, all those naughty bits in the Westminster Confession that we don't believe in. Um, we're located just outside of Inverness in a place called Dingwall, it's about 12 miles out of Inverness, and the college was founded back in 1994. I've been teaching here since 1999. Uh, for five years, I was a full-time tutor here, teaching all the church history modules. But then in 2004, my own church decided to set me aside as their full-time preaching elder, uh, which I am still at the moment. That's in Inverness Reformed Baptist Church. So I'm now part-time at the college, but I do still teach most of the church history modules here. Well, good. Uh, obviously, I did have the opportunity of coming up there. In fact, uh, so uh, I, my first visit was in 2005. So um, was that sort of a transitionary period at the church there? Because uh, I believe uh, some others were still were still there, or? That must have been a year after I was inducted as the pastor. So yes. I was still, still getting used to it. Yeah. <laughs> and I still am getting, getting used to it. <laughs> well, that, that is a lifelong process. And I do have a picture uh, that uh, Roger Brazier took of me next to uh, the lake, and I'm pointing at Nessie. And so I... I oh, uh, <laughs> you, you can't really make her out real well, but uh, I, I tried to get some money off that picture, but I guess there's a lot of those... Uh, uh, do you ever get asked when people figure out the connection between the school and where it is uh, about that uh, that particular subject? Not not very often, um, and and I'm I'm an agnostic, I suppose myself on the existence <laughs> of the um, It seems scientifically very unlikely there is anything, but on the other hand, you've got all these strange, credible eyewitness testimonies. So I'm not quite sure what to make of it. I've never seen it myself. Well, there you go. I do have to tell a story. I, I don't know if you remember this, but I, I think the second time I, I came up there, I even took the time to do some research, and I bought uh, a tartan tie, the official Inverness tartan. And right. when, I, when I wore it, I, I asked some folks uh, after the service, and they all just sort of looked at me and said, nobody up here really cares about that stuff. <laughs> Is, uh, is that sort of how it is, uh, unfortunately? About tartans and ties? Yes. Um, oh, people in the, the more conservative churches here do care very much about ties. And I was, <laughs> I was, I was rebuked once because I, I turned up without wearing one. Uh, it was in my pocket and I hadn't put it on yet. Uh, as, for, as for the tartan side of things, I think that's probably more an American preoccupation, to be honest, rather than a Scottish one. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry about that. Um, now, you're somewhat of a transplant yourself, aren't you? Indeed. I am English, not Scottish. I was born and brought up in London. And uh, I first came up to Scotland back way back in, oh dear, I don't even like to say how long ago it was. A very long time ago, I came up to Edinburgh University where I studied theology. That's where I did what we used to call the BD, uh, the Bachelor of Divinity, which doesn't exist anymore. It's just a BA in these days. And having done my BD there, I stayed on for another ooh, five years to do my PhD uh, in Edinburgh University. So that meant I'd been in Scotland for, for nine years, solid studying. So that kind of cemented my relationship with the country, really. And I've been here most of the time since. So... Now, I've, I've gotten to spend a lot of time in London. Where, whereabouts did you grow up? Uh, well, I grew up south of the river uh, in a place called Plumstead near Woolwich, which you may not have heard of. Um, haven't been there, even though the, uh, the church that I last spoke in was, quote-unquote, south of the river uh, as well. But uh, 
just such a, an incredible, incredible city. Uh, do you get to get get back there once in a while, or, or are you stuck up in the cold? No, my my family still lives in southeast London. That's my sister, niece, and my nephew and my two grand nieces. So I get back to see them about three or four times a year, but that would be between April and October. I just don't venture back during the winter months. It's not worth it. The, uh, there are too many problems with, with weather and trains breaking down and so forth. <laughs> uh, well, I imagine it's uh, it might be getting a little cold there. I mean, if it's uh, it was near freezing here in the desert southwest this morning. So um, I don't know what the weather's like there, but uh, we finally have some, finally have some cold here. Now you went, uh, you went up there to do your studies. So, PhD in church history. Uh, you know, most ch- church historians are sort of odd ducks. Um, yeah. What, what, what causes someone to want to study uh, church history? What, what grabbed hold of you and said, "This is, this is where you need to go." Yeah, well, that's quite interesting, because uh, when I was at school, I had no interest whatsoever in history, and I dropped the subject as soon as I possibly could. But when I was converted, um, almost instantaneously, I developed a thirst for church history. Um, My thinking was, in becoming a Christian, I have joined a people, the people of Christ, and I, now I want to know all about their life story. So that was there right from the word go. I was instantly plunged into the study of church history as a, a kind of corollary of my conversion. Now that's how it began, and it's just remained with me ever since. I, I can't understand people who are not interested in the history of their spiritual community, to be honest. Well, that means you can't understand, unfortunately, a very large portion of folks. Now, maybe not so much, maybe not so much in in the United Kingdom, uh, you know, in Scotland and London. I mean, you're surrounded by history. I mean, uh, yeah. Yeah. You, you can't escape it. It's it's chiseled into the walls around you. Though mm-hmm. I think most Londoners just walk past that stuff and never really take much uh, much interest in it, unfortunately. But here in the United States, um, I have I have often said, and unfortunately, the only reason it's humorous is because it is so very very true. For the vast majority of folks, church history began with Billy Graham, um, <laughs> and so there. Your experience is: I want to know what Christ has been doing with His people all these years. Absolutely. For most everybody else. That's that's something that has to be explained, maybe cajoled, um, uh, maybe and even use a little bit of of a guilt trip, uh, you know, <laughs> to to say to people, "What you think? Uh, you think you're the first person the Holy Spirit's been working with? Don't you think you might you might have something to learn from somebody else?" Um, uh, doesn't that strike you as uh, making uh, uh, Americans just a, a little bit self-centered? Well, I, I, I wouldn't uh, load Americans with a, a peculiar burden of guilt. Then. Uh, <laughs> the, the problem is universal, probably, and I, I have encountered it quite a lot over here. And to some extent, I am I might not be the right person to try and deal with that, because, just because I don't understand it. It doesn't resonate with me at all, that kind of ahistoricism. Um, as I said, the, my very conversion seemed to me to be a joining of a people. And I, I could not conceive of not wanting to know about what this people had been doing and experiencing over the past 2,000 years. Um, so I might not be the right person to deal with that. Uh, although I have tried in, in various talks I've given here and there to, to encourage people to take an interest in the history of the church, uh, quoted things like, you know, uh, a nation without a history is like a man without a memory. And we are the nation of God. If we don't know our own history, we're suffering from a kind of amnesia. Amnesia is unnatural and harmful. Let's get ourselves out of that state of mind. Well, now, uh, what was your focus uh, in your in your PhD work? What was your your specific narrow narrow field? Oh yeah, well, it was very narrow, of course, uh, as PhDs tend to be. I looked at 
the life and the theological work of a 19th century Scottish theologian named Thomas Erskine of Linlatham, who I came across when I was doing my BD. I was reading a book by C.S. Lewis. I forget which book it was now, but in each chapter of the book, he headed the chapter with a quotation. And one of the quotations was, was by someone, Erskine of Linlatham. And the quote was, I think, uh, those who will not have God for their religion make religion into their God. And I thought, well, that's quite a nice snappy quotation, but who on earth was Erskine of Linlatham? <laughs> so I did a bit of research into who he was, and I became interested in him. So when I got the opportunity to do a PhD, I thought, well, let's see if I can do my PhD on, on Erskine. Let's see if I've got an original thesis here. So basically what I did was an intellectual biography of the man. I plotted the development of his thinking through his published writings. Um, basically, he began as what you could call an evangelical Calvinist, and he ended, unfortunately, as a typical Victorian liberal, uh, believing in the universal fatherhood of God and the universal salvation of all mankind. Hmm. So I was looking at how did he get from the one to the other? What was this process, and, and can we see it? emerging in different stages. So that was what my thesis was about. Well, now that raises a real interesting uh, question, um, and that is, okay, uh, for a lot of folks, when you say we're a part of a people, they look back through the history of the church, and yeah. they see a tremendous number of concepts and thoughts expressed that would be uh, troubling from an orthodox perspective, of course, depending on how you def def define and, and uh, uh, delineate the term orthodox. That's one yeah. of the reasons that a lot of conservatives uh, struggle with uh, uh, even what they might consider an over-interest in, in church history, or if someone comes from a fundamentalist background. One of the reasons that church history is primarily ignored within fundamentalism is you encounter way too many people that didn't look like us and act like us and believe like us and worship like us and dress like us and talk like us. So how did you deal with that? Uh, I mean, was, was your, uh, what, 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 well, first of all, what kind of, uh, when you were converted, what, what kind of a church were you a part of? Uh, same type of church you're, you're, you're an elder in a Reformed Baptist church, right? Yes. Um, no, uh, I began as an Anglican. Okay. Uh, I, I worshipped in my local Church of England parish church for several years, where um, the curate, that's the kind of second in command under the vicar, uh, was an evangelical. Uh, I'm not quite sure, to be honest, what the vicar was. He was a believing man. But I'm not quite sure how you would describe him theologically. But the curate, who was evangelical, ran the youth group. So, of course, I was young at the time, so I gravitated towards the youth group. And the evangelicalism of that group was, uh, was undoubted. Um, it was only a few years after that that I began to drift away uh, after I discovered uh, Reformed theology, of which not much was in evidence uh, at this particular church. And so that set me off on a quest for a church where I would feel more spiritually at home. And that, uh, that ended me up in a Reformed Baptist church. Um, but I personally didn't, I didn't have that sense of looking at troubling ideas um, when I was looking at Erskine of Linlatham. Uh, I guess right from my conversion, I'd been exposed to all kinds of eclectic ideas and I'd had to forge my own way uh, towards what I considered to be a, a sound understanding of the faith. So I was quite used to interacting uh, with folks of different opinions, different backgrounds, and different periods in history as well. So I didn't actually have that troubling problem that, that other people do seem to have. Well, yeah, other people do seem to have that. It seems to be, in, in my experience, one of the barriers in my trying to get people uh, to really do much reading is if you, for example, uh, if you just pick up uh, the Holmes edited edition of the Apostolic Fathers or something like that, even in something that early, you're going to find quite a range. I mean, you're, you've got some great stuff. Uh, you've got, I mean, I, I love reading Ignatius, and there's just some incredibly deep 
uh, theology there, and I mean his his references to the deity of Christ, and I, I love that. I love that text where you have. Um, the Father, the Son, the Spirit. The, the Spirit is the engine, uh, uh, you know, raising up the cross and you know, you know, all this kind of stuff. But then there's some other stuff that, let's just be honest, isn't all, uh, you know, isn't exactly going to thrill us with its uh, depth or even its orthodoxy from our perspective. That seems to be really problematic for people. Um, you're saying that was not something... Was it was it just simply your upbringing? Was it just simply the Anglican middle road type thing? What is it that gave you the ability to filter and to go, hey, uh, we live in a fallen world. There's going to be people who have different opinions. A lot of people over here, once they're exposed to that, just go, eh, nobody really knows what the truth is. Look at all these people, all these different opinions they had. Let's just simply you know, not worry about anymore. Um, that's sort of where they go. You didn't do that. Was it uh, the, the context that kept you from doing that or what? Difficult question, but I think if I, if I try to answer it with as much memory of my early Christian life as I can muster, and my memory is becoming increasingly fallible, um, but at around about the same time, very soon after my conversion, uh, and by the way, the, um, the chief influence in the process of my conversion was C.S. Lewis. Um, his writings were what convinced me of the intellectual truth of Christianity, coming from basically a background of atheism and agnosticism. So under God, I, I know an awful lot to C.S. Lewis. Uh, but quite soon after my conversion, I discovered Around about the same time, maybe not exactly the same time, I discovered, firstly, uh, Bettinson's two volumes, The Early Christian Fathers and The Later Christian Fathers. I'm sure you know yes. those. Uh, collections from the writings of all the major fathers, father by father, and within each father, he arranges it like a systematic theology. So it's topical, what this particular father taught about God, the Trinity, creation, the fall, redemption, the church and sacraments, the last things, and so on. Now, as far as I can recollect, I devoured those two volumes and found them almost immeasurably helpful in my understanding of the basics of the faith, particularly the Trinity and the Incarnation. So right from almost the word go, I would say I owed a lot to the teaching of the early church fathers. But around about the same time, I also discovered the Reformation. And I can't remember now how that happened, but I discovered in particular the two great giants of the Reformation, Luther and Calvin. Uh, I remember reading Calvin's Institutes. I remember reading Luther on the bondage of the will. So those two foci uh, became quite important for me, the fathers and the reformers. And of course, the fathers are not necessarily identical with what the reformers are saying, and Luther isn't necessarily identical with what Calvin is saying. So from that very early point in my Christian life, I had these three elements overlapping in my thinking, patristic theology, Lutheran theology, and reformed theology. So maybe that was what enabled me to have an attitude of, a, of sifting and filtering and thinking things out for myself rather than just having some monolithic outlook um, sort of imposed on me. So, so maybe that was it. Well, it, it would seem to... Uh, someone like myself didn't have that kind of a background, and so it's something that I had to develop. Uh, again, studying church history is going to force you to recognize that uh, people have not always looked like me and, and thought exactly like me and spoken exactly like me, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So... It, Thank goodness, it, eh? <laughs> very much so. Yes, <laughs> yes. Well, they didn't have coogies, uh back in the early church, so uh, you know that was that. That was definitely a. Uh, <laughs> Rich just yelled something from the other room, and I'm not really sure what it was, but I'm not going to worry about that. He's just trying to distract me. So, but the the idea being though that that uh, I've been talking a lot recently about uh, what are foundational and definitional things over against adiaphora, things that do not uh, define. And 
I think a lot of people listening, uh, certain and certain people even within our own ranks, that would uh, hear names like C.S. Lewis. Oh, oh, but he said this and he said that. People who have a very small list of adiaphora and a very large list of absolutely foundational definitional, the, those that have more of a fundamentalist streak in them, automatically start going, oh, I'm not so sure about this guy. Um, and they're the same ones that I would think would struggle with the continuing validity or relevance of reading um, the early church or any part of church history, I suppose. Um, mm-hmm. Somehow you avoided the 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 twin uh, terrors of of either going into a form of fundamentalism that would cause you to reject everyone in the ancient church that didn't look exactly like you, and then the other side being, well, there can't be any one truth. I mean, because if you're a if you're an elder in a Reformed Baptist church, there's a confession of faith. It's a it's a pretty you know, uh, pretty full statement of of faith. You've you've managed to to keep that uh, keep that balance. Um, any words of wisdom to try to help the rest of us try to keep that balance as well? Uh, and it is the 1689 confession. Yes, in my in my church, so it is quite detailed. Um, I don't know. I mean, if you take that that fundamentalist, as, as you call it. I mean, we, we don't have an awful lot of that kind of American fundamentalism in the United Kingdom, but if you, if you take that attitude that you were just describing there, where you've got uh, an awful lot of, of doctrines and positions that are considered non-negotiable, and perhaps very few that are considered to be adiaphora or things indifferent, then I mean, you have to ask yourself the question then, don't you? Um, if this is Christianity, this this dotting every I and crossing every T of a fundamentalist outlook, if that's what Christianity is, then how come it hasn't existed for very long? Yeah. Um, what was happening the previous 1,800, 1,900 years? I mean, were there, was there no Christianity before this? What about the Lord's promise? I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. There's actually a theological principle involved here that when Christ founded his church, he promised that the gates of Hades never would prevail against it. So there always has been a church of Christ on the earth. And if that's the case, it becomes us to discern it, to see where it was and what it was doing and how things that have been said and done in the past have unavoidably shaped the present because we can't escape from that legacy. But when it comes to the early church fathers in particular, um, I don't see how we can really avoid saying that they were the ones who in the providence of God laid all the foundations for our understanding of the Trinity and of Christology. So if they got that right, which I think they did, they can't all have been a load of, you know, irrelevant people uh, whose ideas we can just scorn or ignore, because we today are still standing on their shoulders regarding the doctrine of God and the doctrine of the person of Christ. And I myself still derive a huge amount of blessing and benefit from reading the Father's even though I don't necessarily agree with every single thing that any particular father said. Uh, I think I'm running out of steam here, but maybe you'd like <laughs> to chip in and contribute something yourself at that point. <laughs> no, well, it, it is interesting. It seems that uh, that then would be behind... Uh, I have a, a set of books sitting here next to me called uh, 2,000 Years of Christ's Power, and... Um, uh, now, it's current. I currently have four volumes. Isn't there a, a fifth in the works? That's a terrible series of books. I don't know why you've got those. <laughs> I mean, uh, uh, I, I, of course, I, I wrote them. That's why they're so terrible. Um, the first four volumes take the story up to roughly the beginning of the 18th century. So volume one is the early church fathers. Volume two is the Middle Ages. Volume three 
is the Renaissance and the Reformation. Volume four is very, very roughly 1550 or thereabouts to 1740 or thereabouts. So that's as far as the series has got uh, uh, thus far. And yes, there is theoretically uh, another volume uh, in the pipeline um, where, of course, the inevitably the dominating subject for the fifth volume is going to be the Great Awakening, or as we call it, the Evangelical Revival. Um, to be honest, I haven't actually started writing that volume there yet. The last year has been, uh, I've been preoccupied with other things, but that volume is scheduled to be written, and I have a committee breathing down my neck to make sure <laughs> that I do begin to write it and even finish writing it. So hopefully within the next few years, volume five will uh, appear. Uh, it will begin with the Great Awakening. I'm not quite sure where this fifth volume is going to end. It certainly isn't going to bring the story up to the present day. Uh, it's probably going to stop somewhere in the, the 19th century, I would imagine. Well, uh, doesn't it get dangerous when you start getting close to the period of your uh, your PhD dissertation? Because then the book has to be like 8,000 pages long just to cover everything. <laughs> well, one problem is that um, the further you get or should I say, the nearer that you get to the present day, the more information you have on your hands. Right. There's this continual information explosion, uh, which became absolutely atomic or nuclear uh, once the printing press was invented. Um, and, of course, the other thing is that the closer you get to the present day, the more Christianity branches out into different storylines. So sort of having a multiplicity of information, you've got a multiplicity of stories to try and tell, which is why each volume gets fatter uh, than the previous one. And the other thing is that the nearer you get to your present day, the more difficult it is to have a sense of historical perspective. Mm. So I, I certainly don't intend to bring the story, when I get to the last volume, I don't intend to bring the story beyond the impact of the Second Vatican Council. That, that's going to be my cutoff point. Oh, yeah, I would imagine so. So, uh, when did you first, uh, Volume 1, when, when, did you, when did you start this, uh, this whole project? Right, well, this project was the result of time that I spent teaching in Nigeria. Uh, I taught in the Samuel Bill Theological College, which is the denominational college of the Kwa Ibo Church in Nigeria. Quite an interesting denomination. It has a Presbyterian form of church government, but practices believers' baptism. Hmm. Now, I believe there are one or two others like that in the world, but uh, there aren't many of them. Now, the Nigerian students, uh, English was their common language. There are many tribal languages in Nigeria. Uh, so in order to communicate with each other, they need a lingua franca, and that's English. But it's not a particularly sophisticated kind of English. I mean, it's good and it's workable, but it, it's not sophisticated. And so I was landed with this problem. Um, what shall I ask my students to read? What texts shall I ask them to read in church history? Because on the one hand, you've got these really good, solid, scholarly, academic books full of superb research and thoroughly historically grounded and reliable. But the range of English used in these books is rather too high for my Nigerian students. On the other hand, you've got books that are written at their level, books that are written in accessible English and are presented accessibly. But to be honest, the kind of history presented in those books is not particularly well grounded in historical scholarship. So there seems to be a gap here. Maybe I can fill it. That was the idea that I had. So when I got back from my time in Nigeria, I floated that idea uh, to a friend of mine who at that time was involved in Grace Publications, which is a Grace Baptist, a Reformed Baptist publishing house over here, John Appleby, uh, who went to be with Christ uh, not so long ago. I said, look, I've got this idea, a church history series, which is well-researched historically, which is academically credible, but it's pitched at a level that the average person in the pew should be able to understand, as long as they're ready to sit down and, and, and read it as a piece of hard work. 
do you have any ideas who might be prepared to publish a, a work like this? Because, I mean, I don't know the publishing world. You're involved in the publishing world. Do you have any suggestions? So John Appleby said, yes, we'll publish it. So that set me off. And uh, within a few years, I'd written volume one on the early church fathers. And that came out, I believe, oh, was it about 1998? I think that was first published. And ever since then, Grace Publications have been behind the publication uh, of this series until recently, when for various reasons that are far too complex to go into, the project is now with Christian Focus Publications. And all the volumes, was it last year, have been reissued in hardback. Right. And they're and they're all revised versions, apart from the most recent one, which hasn't had a chance to be revised yet. But volumes one, two, and three are not only in hardback for the first time now, but they are substantially revised. Yeah, I love the format. Uh, they're doing a, a great job. They look great together. Uh, mm -hmm. We've certainly been recommending them to folks. And um, yeah, at first it was, it was a, these fairly large paperbacks uh, when I first saw them. And um, I like the new format uh, a lot better. So, um, so do I. So do I. Yeah, yeah. They look great, and we're we're trying to. You know, people are always asking for for resources. You know, what can I get? And so, uh, we've certainly been uh, seeking to direct folks uh, to uh, to that set. It'll be very helpful to them. Um, now, uh, so make it, as far as your publications goes, would you consider that the the central aspect of what you've done? Um, uh, you know, is that really where you want to keep focusing your attention in the future? Obviously, if you've got Volume 5 to do, you're going to have to be focusing your attention on that in the future. But um, uh, was that something you had had planned or just sort of jumped out, out at you because you saw a need? It, it, was, it was the inspiration provided by that experience in Nigeria. Um, I had no idea, however, that the series was going to be so long. I mean, my first idea was to do it in one volume. That soon became impractical once I'd started writing it because I realized I already had enough to fill one volume dealing purely with the early church period. Uh, and then I started saying to people, oh, it will be a three volume work. And then that, that idea was scotched uh, when I wrote volume three and it didn't get beyond the Reformation. So then I started telling people it would be a four volume work uh, and now that idea has been scotched as well, because volume four only goes up to the 18th century. So, I mean, who knows uh, how many volumes there will be? Maybe it'll have to be called 3,000 years of <laughs> by the time they're finished. So there is that, there is that ongoing work. Uh, but I do dabble in other things. Um, I occasionally write articles or chapters in, in, in other books, uh, multi-authorship books. So there's a book on the doctrine of justification coming out. Uh, I thought it might perhaps be out this year to celebrate the 500th anniversary, but it, it hasn't come out. Um, it's edited by Matthew Barrett, and it's quite an exhaustive treatment. It's got a, a systematic theology section on justification, an exegetical section, and a church history section. And for my sins, I was uh, tasked with writing the chapter from Augustine through to the end of the Middle Ages. Oh, my. Um, which was mind-boggling for me <laughs> and might well be mind-boggling for anyone who ends up reading that chapter themselves. So there is that kind of thing. And then my most recent thing, as you'll know, was my, my little book of readings from the early church fathers, uh, which took uh, quite some time to try to gather that material together. Uh, so that finally came out, um, when was that, October maybe? That finally came out. Uh, it's in a series done by Christian Focus, these daily readings handbooks in a kind of nice pseudo leather design. So they have books like daily readings from Matthew Henry, from George Whitfield, from the Puritans. So they approached me and said, how about doing one on the early church fathers? So, I mean, obviously I jumped at that because it's a kind of a dream come true really for me, given my appreciation of uh, so much of, of what the fathers said uh, and achieved. So there I've got uh, each month is given over to one specific father. So I chose my 12 favorites. And within each month, I've tried to give a, uh, a spread of readings on topics like the nature of theology itself, 
the doctrine of the Trinity, the person and work of Christ, general edifying passages to be applied to the believer's own life, and then lastly, uh, the last things, heaven and hell. So as I say, that's now out. And uh, personally speaking, if all my works perished except one, I'd rather have that one survive, because that isn't me speaking. That's the, the best wisdom of the Father's speaking in that particular volume. Ah, well, that's interesting. I'm holding it uh, for folks here. Um, uh, yeah, I wanted to get to that next, the early church uh, father's daily readings. Now, you did crush me, though, just a little bit there, when you—this yeah. isn't real leather? I'm, I'm, I'm really well, hurt I, now. I thought, it, I thought that was pseudo-leather. <laughs> sure, it would be ten times more expensive if that was real leather. Uh, I'm, uh, probably so. Uh, obviously, uh, over here, Crossway Publications has made this leatherette-type thing uh, extremely, extremely popular. But anyways, we've got uh, January, we've got... Uh, John Chrysostom, uh, John the Golden Mouth. Uh, we've got uh, February is Irenaeus. March is uh, Gregory, Gregory the Theologian. How would we know him? It, that's different. Is that just Gregory? That's not Greg. Because you've got it's Gregory of Nazianzus. 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 Gregory Nazianzus. Okay. Nazianzus. Oh, okay. In, right. the, in the Eastern Church, he's called Gregory the Theologian. And since he's an Eastern father, I decided to give him his Eastern name. I see. Okay. All right. That'll help people understand that one, because we, we've got Gregory of Nyssa down below, so sometimes uh, we've got to keep him separate. Uh, we've got St. Cyprian in April, uh, Basil of Caesarea in May, Jerome in June, uh, Gregory of Nyssa July, Augustine gets, uh, well, <laughs> Augustine gets August. That was purposeful, wasn't it? <laughs> it wasn't. <indeed. laughs> Uh, Cyril of Jerusalem for September, Ambrose, October, uh, Cyril of Alexandria for November, and currently reading with uh, the great Athanasius uh, in the month of December. Now, I'll be perfectly honest with you. I'm, I'm a little bit on the biased side. Um, November would be slim pickings for me. I, I, uh, I don't know. Uh, I'm not sure why in my readings uh, Cyril has has. I've got other favorites, shall we say? But uh, we all uh, we all have our our favorites uh, this uh, this uh, direction and that direction. But um, uh, we all have our theological blind spots, James. <laughs> Cyril of Alexandria, obviously. <laughs> okay. Well, I think he had a few as well, but uh, maybe it's just <laughs> simply uh, how he interacted with others. But uh, uh, so uh, I guess there's a whole series of these, uh, but uh, it would be a great way of introducing folks. Obviously, a little late on the Christmas season, but a great way of uh, before the uh, new year, maybe something to give to a. Uh, uh, your elders, your pastors, uh, some some daily readings, some introduction to uh, church history topics and things uh, things like that. And it's uh, very very well done, and um, uh, I was uh, glad. I when I, I guess when I got mine in the mail initially, I, I made reference to the fact that uh, mine wasn't wasn't signed, and uh, your publisher evidently heard this. And uh, so we received two copies, and uh, the one that I have now, it has a signature in it, and I'm I'm hoping it's yours. <laughs> it's it, it is mine. It, it is, is mine. <laughs> it's genuine. I, I, I mean, you know, the publisher could have done it. I wouldn't. I I'm probably not. wouldn't have asked. You know. Uh, so uh, I'm I'm glad it, to glad to have that. It's mine, and it's worth its weight in gold. So you look after it. <laughs> so. Uh, obviously, Volume 5 uh, is going to be taking up a lot of your time, but are there other other writing projects that you have uh, coming up? No, nothing specific in the way of writing projects, but uh, people may like to be reminded that um, I teach at the Highland Theological College, so we've got a whole new semester coming up in which I'll get the first-year students for the first time. And that's always our largest body of students, the first years, and uh, for various reasons. <laughs> and, <laughs> I was going to say, you might want to expand upon that a little bit. We whittle them down over the years. Uh, <laughs> no, it, well, there's an element of that, but it, it's that um, it's only in the first year of our of our BA that subjects are compulsory. Right. Once you 
second year, you, you choose. And so obviously not all of them are going to choose to carry on with church history. Uh, so given that we have um, one year in which all the students are, are going to do church history, we decided the thing that they should know about would be the Reformation. Hmm. So first year church history, Reformation. So there will be that coming up. Uh, and I also teach the medieval church history module in the second semester too. So I have two classes running uh, with all those wonderful essays that I have to mark and grade. And then there's the ongoing discipline of sermon preparation. I have to preach three sermons a week, uh, Wednesday, Sunday morning, and Sunday evening. So I've got I've got things that keep me going even oh, yes. when I'm not working on a literary <clears throat> project. So uh, you haven't yet, y'all haven't given in to the no more Sunday night uh, movement across the world yet, huh? Well, that that is beginning to cash on among even reformed evangelicals uh, in the United Kingdom. Um, not in our particular congregation, and I'm not aware of any. Uh, reformed church in Inverness that has gone that way. But uh, I've got a, a very good friend who lives in Edinburgh, and he was telling me that that's definitely the way that the evangelical churches in Edinburgh are going. Drop your evening service. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's it's popular. I mean, we, uh, we are uh, absolutely encased in stone in our, our, our own group, so that's... Uh, uh, they they would have to board up the doors, I would imagine, to get us to not have our Sunday evening services. But uh, uh, it does seem to be uh, more and more the uh, the case around uh, around the world. But uh, I'm not 100 percent certain of all the reasons for that, especially in light of the fact that we have more ease of transportation now than we've ever had at any time in the history of the church. So, but yeah. you know. Uh, each each age of the church, as you well know, is is different along those those lines as to what their practices were. So, well, I remember when, when I was doing my PhD on Thomas Erskine, he spent a good number of years doing the continental tour, as uh, people were wont to do back in the nineteenth century. And one of the things that he remarks on in his letters is that continental Protestants, can you believe it, don't have an evening service on Sunday. Hmm. So maybe uh, it was a peculiarly uh, British and American thing. I'm not sure. That's but, possible, yeah. Uh, I've I'm never just, looked into it, uh, I, I must admit. Um, the, the practices of... Well, you said you're going to... Now, what I did find interesting, you said you're going to be teaching both Reformation and Medieval. It, it, would, it, it seems to me that if you just d- jump into the Reformation period... Uh, when I was, we, we had a tour in, um, in Germany back in uh, late September, and that's when I got the opportunity of preaching at the Castle Church in Wittenberg, and, and we went to the Wartburg Castle, and, and uh, we shot a little video in, um, uh, where at the Terror Hole in the, uh, at, at the Wartburg Castle, um, where the, 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 the Terror the... Hole, um, uh, Fritz Erba, where Fritz Erba was imprisoned. Um, and se- since it's so far down, the entrance at the top was called the terror hole because you literally lowered the prisoner into this pure darkness, this dungeon. And so mm-hmm. they would experience terror as they went down through that, uh, that hole into that, into that darkness because there's, there are no, there are no uh, windows in that uh, in that tower. It's just uh, an amazing thing to consider living uh, down there, especially the fact that he survived for seven years is uh, is astounding. Like a story by Edgar Allan Poe, really, doesn't it? Yeah, uh, in in some ways. Well, and then to think the fact that they brought Lutheran uh, uh, ministers in to attempt to convert him from up at that hole. I'm not I'm not really sure. <laughs> you know, when you think about it. Um, you know, I know what they're trying to do. I mean, and that you know, that's the only, your only way out. You're not going to get out any other way. Uh, but at the same time, if you're really trying to convert someone by actually uh, convincing them the truthfulness of what you're saying, that's a rather strange thing to think about. But bit as it may, we shot a video um, up there in that little teeny tiny room uh, that surrounds that um, that hole. They've got a light down in the actual. Uh, dungeon, so you can just see how amazingly far down it is. It's. Uh, uh, I was just really struck by the 
nexus of that room. Oh, goodness. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, it's, it's the computer's, key, it's the church, uh, school's keyboard anyways, right? Uh, it is. It's not mine. <laughs> but I, I, I don't mind what happens to it. <laughs> as long as it doesn't explode in my face, I, I'm quite happy. Uh, okay, sorry about that. Um, I, I just, I was just struck uh, when I was there by how close that dungeon was to Luther's room where he translated the Bible while hiding from imperial forces, and just the how close in time they were, and yet the role of sacralism, state church. That's really what caused me to start thinking so much about that while we were there at the Wartburg. And I was very thankful that the folks that were doing the tour were able to so quickly arrange to bring our people up, uh, to record something there. Um, but, but one of the things I was going to mention to you was when we began our tour, the first night while we were in Berlin before we started, I gave somewhat of a lecture, and I was talking about the fact, I, I sort of in passing mentioned, now I realize that I would not be a welcome person in Luther's Wittenberg. I would not be a welcome person in Calvin's Geneva. Um, mm -hmm. And even though someone like Martin Bootser was maybe a little bit more broad-minded, Bootser's um, yeah. uh, writings on the Jews, for example, uh, in 1538 or so, you know, you know, were very strident, very strong, very common in that, in that time period. And um, I, the, the folks that were doing the tour took me aside afterwards and said, you, you do realize how unusual uh, it is for someone to say the things you were just saying. And I'm like, well, what do you mean? How can you address this topic without talking about those things. And I, I, I sort of became very concerned that especially during this Reformation period, which isn't past, I, I'm trying to tell folks, you know, it's, it, okay, okay, so October 31st came and went. Now we get to have 500 anniversaries of all sorts of cool stuff. We've got the Augsburg mm -hmm. Disputation, and we've got, uh, uh, you know, we've got Worms coming up, and, and uh, Heidel, the Heidelberg Disputation, Marburg Colloquy. We've got all sorts of cool stuff to be looking forward to. But for most folks, like, ah, okay, we did our celebration. Let's move on from there. I've been trying to say to folks, look, um, we, we can't have a cartoonish view of what took place in the Reformation. Uh, we need to recognize who these men were, what made them tick. Uh, we need to recognize that the Reformers were not in and of themselves, you know, superheroes with a big uh, red S on their chest. They, uh, you know, we have to let them be who they were, um, yeah. which I guess is the same thing about the early church as well. Um, but it just struck me uh, being over there uh, and being in those places uh, just how important it is that we do history in a, I think, a responsible fashion. And even we who, uh, you know, everybody wants to look back in history and see themselves. We all want to look down to the well and see ourselves staring back at, our, uh, at us. And it, we have to be very, very careful. It ends up perverting history. A anything you want to add to that? No, I, I do agree with that. We're all caught up in not only the flux of history, but the flux of fallen world. So history itself is fallen. Everything is distorted one way or another, uh, even in the church. And I often say to people, uh, let's suppose the world lasts for another few hundred years. People, Christians in the future, are going to be looking back at us and saying, how on earth could they have believed that? How on earth could they have practiced that? And we don't see it because we have our own historical blindness uh, to our own context. So yes, every age has its own virtues and its own vices, and it's extremely hard to think yourself out of that. Well, you had mentioned earlier that as you get closer uh, to the current time period, you lose that historical perspective. And I've often said that the, the primary reason, well, I'm teaching church history at, at PRBC right now. We've been at it for, I don't know, about 40, 46, 47 lessons so far. And uh, we're only in the medieval period someplace, and uh, in, in the introduction I said to folks, this is one of the few times, uh, church history is one of the few opportunities that we have to see ourselves in a mirror, 
because we're, we're too close. We're too close to our current controversies. We're too close to uh, what's going on in our own lives. We really don't have uh, the perspective. But if Christ has been building his church, then we can look back and, uh, for example, the subject of persecution. When you, when you look at the first schisms in what yeah. was called the Catholic Church, and obviously Catholic with a different meaning than Roman Catholic today, those schisms were almost all due to the reaction uh, to the subject of persecution and how you handled that particular issue. Well, we have lots of Christians under persecution today, and yet the vast majority of Christians have never even stopped to think, huh, I wonder how people before us handled these issues and these subjects. And so we keep having to repeat the same things over and over and over again. We all know the old saying, if you, you know, forget history, you're doomed to repeat it. Well, it unfortunately is extremely true. And we, we end up, I, I don't know, from my perspective, it seems to me there's a tremendous amount of arrogance on the part of modern Christians to think that we can just simply get along just fine without having any consideration whatsoever concerning those who lived the faith before us. That seems like an amazingly arrogant attitude. It, it does, and it's also interesting, of course, that when you go back to the um, uh, those attitudes to persecution and how to deal uh, with persecution in the early church and with people who lapsed under persecution, uh, the attitudes were not monolithic. Uh, you had a kind of a an extreme right-wing approach that anybody who lapses under persecution, that's the end. They can never be forgiven. They can never be received back into the church. And then you had a kind of a, an extreme left-wing view, to, to use that terminology, whereby, oh, well, if they lapsed under persecution, uh, as long as they profess repentance, just immediately let them back in, everything is forgiven. And then you had the more middle position that was taken by uh, most people, that, well, you, you can uh, allow people back into the church who lapse under persecution, but you can't just let them back in kind of by waving a magic wand over them. They have to show sincerity and repentance before allowing them back. So you get, you get these different approaches even back then. You know, our forefathers weren't, uh, they didn't all think in the same way. No, they didn't. And, uh, you know, I've, I've often said we need to let the early church fathers be the early church fathers. Uh, we, we can't try to turn them into something they weren't. I think that's honestly one of my strongest criticisms of Roman Catholic theology uh, today, is that they attempt to create a uh, monolithic consensus dogmatically on the part of the early church. It just simply didn't exist. And so you end up forcing them into a, a form that they, they never actually had. But Protestants do the same thing in reverse, just not as dogmatically. Um, yeah. they, they don't allow them to be what they, they really were. And, and as you said, if, if the Lord were to tarry, um, it, I don't remember the day when I realized, you know, I've written some books now, I... I I might want to extend the same type of grace to those who've come before me as I would like to ask of those who are to come after me. You know, uh, when, you, when you actually start seeing yourself in the flow of history, um, yeah. it, it completely changes the perspective you have as to how you're to uh, treat others. But that's, mm. that's where eschatology uh, comes in, because uh, it does seem to me that there are certain eschatological perspectives that diminish any type of uh, desire to actually place yourself in church history. If you're the last generation, hey, uh, why polish brass on a sinking ship, you know? <laughs> yes. Uh, and what you just said, was that about looking back on your own books? I mean, uh, I often think that as a preacher. If I, if I look at a sermon I preached 10 years ago, I think, oh, well, you know, if I was preaching that sermon today, it's not quite how I put it. Yes. Any longer. Um, and I do agree with your, your point there about the early church fathers. Uh, they were neither Protestants nor Roman Catholics. They were the early church fathers. Right. They, they were patristic. And it's, it's not right, I think, to try to mold them according to some modern preconception, uh, foist an identity on them 
uh, that's actually alien to them. We have to listen to them for what they were, I agree. Well, and then you have to carry that into the modern the modern context as well, and that's where you get into trouble with uh, the fundamentalist-type mindset that says, you know, anybody that doesn't look like me who's alive, uh, I can go ahead and get rid of them and kick them out of the kingdom, and uh, yeah, it, it causes all sorts of problems. Well, uh, Dr. Needham, I first of all, thank you um, for uh, being willing to actually... Uh, be on a program with me. That's sort of dangerous. I'm, I'm not, you know, there there might be certain people that are going to be doing exposés on you now and, and all sorts of things like that. <laughs> it's a it's a wild it's a wild and woolly place here in the United States, and uh, and you've now wandered into uh, into the midst of all that. But uh, in the lion's den, yes. Yes, in the before lion's you, den. Before before I get cut off, can I just say hello to a few people? Oh sure. My friends, Stephen Barton. Al Shook, Cara Devereaux, and Alan Howe. Hello. There you go. <laughs> that will keep them happy. What? What's that? That will keep them happy. Oh no! I no. I, Rich was Rich was yelling through the window at me. Uh, so I was trying to figure out what it was he was saying. But uh, the invisible, inaudible Rich. Yes. Yes. Sort, sort of like in the in the Peanuts cartoons, the teacher. That's that's uh, that's Rich over there. So. Uh, but uh, uh, for those who are still uh, wondering, uh, once again, uh, The Early Church Fathers, edited by Nick Needham in Daily Readings, uh, that's available. You can find that online. And, of course, um, 2,000 Years of Christ's Power, the first four volumes. You might want to uh, pray for Dr. Needham's um, uh, zeal to press forward <laughs> to accomplish uh, uh, Volume 5. Uh, as as quickly as possible, uh, so that we all can get to read that as uh, as well. So, Dr. Needham, thank you very very much for joining with us, and uh, your friendship has been a great a great encouragement. I really, uh, I do want to get back up there. Uh, I, I would love to have the opportunity to uh, uh, to be there once again. It's been quite some time, but uh, I certainly know my way around. Uh, uh, the airports in London, so uh, I should. Hey, I got myself all the way up there uh, all alone once, so I can I can do it again. So we just need to find the time to do it, and uh, it would be great to see you again. You're very welcome anytime. All right, thank you very very much for joining us. God bless you. God bless. All right.